Okay, great. So hi, Ben. How, how are you doing? I am doing well, all things considered. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. How was your 2020, first of all? How has been, how has the my, my apocalypse? Um, I've been asking people how their apocalypse is going. Mine has been um, overall good. I almost feel guilty about it because I know it's been largely hard on everyone. And it has for me just as a person, but as an artist, it's been a huge gift. Um, it's the most amount of time I would say since I was pretty young that I've been able to focus exclusively on what I do. Like actually just the art. Because you can't have meetings, you I don't I can't run my own business. I'm totally independent, so I have to do a million little jobs. And all of those jobs are gone. And I actually have gotten to write, record, and I've gotten back into painting. Um, I'm taking like night classes on things I think are interesting. Like I've had just time to learn and grow exclusively. And I that hasn't happened for me for so long. Like I, I think the last time I really had this much of an incubation period was like 2009. So uh, as an artist, I've been thrilled. I thrive under isolation. As a person, I miss humans and, and all that stuff. I miss, you know, having a... A social life and not generally worrying about an existential disease but yeah I, I almost feel guilty because it's been a largely positive for me so yeah yeah I mean you get to focus on what you what you love the most I think that's that's a blessing yeah. and blessing in disguise almost it is least. it's it's <laughs> it's actually to the point where um I'm a little I'm reluctant to go back. Uh, there's there's a lot about this that I don't want to give up. Um, and I think I'm going to find a way to keep it because I really, um, it, it reduced so much of the former clutter that I believed was necessary. And I've realized I can exist without a lot of it. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of taught me to really, I don't have to worry about so much. I can really focus and it's okay. Not, everything doesn't catch on fire so uh you know good and bad but mostly good good and we're obviously speaking to ben cooper of radical face fame and also uh other projects like electric precedent uh yeah. i think five albums out and a lot of small releases on the radical face yeah uh and a lot uh, of small releases a lot of small letter releases yeah, I've been doing small releases to kind of keep um, things afloat. We're in, a, we're in an odd modern age where you're not allowed to be quiet for any amount of time or you just disappear because the, the robots will stop looking at you if you don't put out enough content. Um, I find it all kind of hilariously dystopian and sci-fi <laughs> that we have to please algorithms and stuff to like exist in these platforms uh so yeah i've been doing a lot of small releases while my my monster of an album i've been making in the background so i have a a 30 song record that i've made uh 30 songs yeah it's gonna be released in chapters at 20 minute chapters because it's too much material to absorb um but i've been working on that for four years in the background so oh it's uh, the um I forget what the name of it is, but I've heard of it. It's called Into it's the Woods. It's a, into the Woods, yeah. Like a, a fairy tale for adults is how I would describe it. Um, but it's very, very theme heavy and very. It turned out very long, much longer than I thought it would be. But that's that's happened before in, in your career. It, it, it happens every time if I'm not careful. And I don't want to be careful on this one. I wanted to just create something uh, unobserved that I could just I could just make and let it be what it's going to be. I'm not concerned with how digestible or its its, it's reception. Um, but I did break it into smaller pieces because I was like, this is going to be an hour and a half of music. This is way too long. So. And now you're doing quite the opposite of releasing quite like you have a newsletter. 
uh, called Hidden Hollow, which is uh, it's just one song at a time. It's this complete opposite approach. Yep, and it was uh, that's honestly been sort of a I don't know a palate cleanser. It's like a like pickled ginger for me, <laughs> like cleanse the palate. I, and I've been making those songs with the complete opposite rule. I give myself a time limit. Usually it's one to two days and I say, make something. And it's, it removes my ability to get obsessive or second guess uh, mm. because I, I will obsessively tweak if left alone and record songs five different ways to see which way I like. And I'm very uh, overdone sometimes. So this was a, a the opposite of I have to make one a month and I have a very short time to work on it. Just whatever comes out. Especially when you have extra amount of time all of a sudden. I guess that, that sort of tinkering thing can get... Oh yeah, it even... can go really crazy. Uh, <laughs> it's been fun. I've never been able to go this far with this much equipment. Like the last time I had a real incubation period like this was... Uh, a long time ago and I had very limited gear and now I've collected for you know equipment for 20 years so yeah. I can be way more obsessive about the sounds which is fun um, for me so yeah yeah I, there's the one of the songs on the new one is uh, Sunshine and you open that with saying in search for the words I filled page after page still not sure what to say yeah which leads us into the topic of the actual conversation, I guess, which is lyrics. Yeah. Um, how do you, where in the, how does lyric fit, how do lyrics fit into your songwriting process? That's probably the way to formulate that question. Uh, lyrics are, for me, they are the, the Goliath I have to slay every time. It is the hardest part to me of making records and songwriting. It's the slowest part and it's the most uh, laborious to me. Um, mm. Not in a bad way, I enjoy doing it, but it's the, it is the hardest for me to feel finished. Um, and so I, I found that like, do you mean like literally though, as far as like where in the process it shows up or just what it is mentally interpret it as you wish <laughs> okay yeah so for me um oftentimes lyrics are the thing that uh are yeah i'd say that i i struggle with the most just because the act of singing something is the lie detector like i can write something that seems good on paper and i can hear the melody in my head and then i sing it and it just doesn't it doesn't mm -hmm. feel right. And that happens all the time. Like, it's like, oh, that's a good idea. Some though, I feel like an idiot. So this is not going to fly and I'm going to start over. <laughs> and, then, uh, and because it has to be sung, that is so different from prose. Like I, I've written a lot of short stories and uh, once upon a time wanted to be a writer uh, before I was going to be a musician. I wrote some books mm -hmm. um, that I lost in a hard drive crash. So, I was very into writing and, and prose is something where you can, um, I don't know, there's a lot of freedom in it. And, and the constrictions that come with songwriting, it's, uh, it's that you have to sing it. I, I, there's so many phrases I like the look of, but I hate the sound of. And uh, then there are ones that sometimes sound right, but don't, I don't quite like them on paper. And usually I want to like both. And mm -hmm. so it's, uh, uh, it feels like a wrestling match to me to get the paper and the voice to, to be in sync with each other. It's, it's difficult, for sure. Yeah, and so that, you said you re-record a lot. Does that mean you rewrite a lot as well? I do. Um, I would say, so for me, like the idea of a song, oftentimes I know thematically what I'm working on. I know what I'm trying to get across or what the idea of the song is. Um, until I have that idea, I, I have no filter and I usually get nowhere. Like I, I, I use themes to, to constrain my mind. I need something to push against. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I, I've, 
writing about myself is not super interesting. I've been trying it more. It's still my least favorite. Um, so I don't look often totally inwards for topics. So usually I need a theme of some kind, something I'm trying to, to capture or get across. But then when you go to write the lyrics, uh, yeah, I end up rewriting them all the time because of just, I know I want a long vowel at exactly this point, but the only vowel that sounds good in this range for me is a long A. So I have to find on the second syllable, a long A and a word that means this. It's like so many rules to get it to fit <laughs> that I can sometimes miss that word for weeks. I just can't think of the word. How do you, how do you find the word? Uh, oftentimes, I have found uh, this is not a very reliable technique, but for some reason it works more than it doesn't. I put the melody in my head, like I decide to like, I know this melody and I'm just gonna hum it a lot. And half the time I come up with the word just like in the shower or cooking or doing something else. I'll just go, I know what to say. And then I'll stop what I'm doing and go record like a demo of it. And I go, okay, I, I found it. That verse is finished. Um, so a lot of times I think it's like a marinating process and subconsciously it'll work itself out. Because um, if I sit there and just try over and over, it usually feels as forced as I'm forcing it. So yeah, if I'm stuck, I tend to just go, I'll just put it in the head and see what it'll come out eventually. <laughs> um, so yeah. And let's take the more literal interpretation of that question. And when in the in the songwriting process do the lyrics come? Uh, so I very rarely, but sometimes start with words. That's my least common technique. I usually start. Uh, I've learned not to write whole sections because. Um, it's really hard to know how all these pieces are going to fit together and feel finished. So a lot of times my initial lyrics are probably, I'd say three to five lines that I've written that I feel encapsulate the idea of the song. And I use the lines as my guide when I'm making music. And then I scrap them once I know my vocal melody. And I try to take that content and put it into the that shape. So for me, lyrics are, are, it's pretty rare that I start with the lyrics. And the only time I've ever been successful is when I'm also starting with a, a decided form. I know I'm going to do verse, chorus, verse, chorus or something. It's a little easier to write the words if I have a form to rely on. But I don't really like verse, chorus writing. <laughs> I like, I tend to like a lot of like, movements or shapes because I, I like to, to use music to accent what the words are going to say or even use music to substitute what the words are going to say i'll put the real content in the music and i'll put the words as almost like what i would tell you as a person like lying to myself but the music tells the truth mm -hmm. i like things like that like juxtapositions and so because of this it's rare that the words are first Usually I'd say somewhere between the middle and towards the end. They're never the last thing though. Once the words are in, I usually, that's when I can finish arrangements. So it's a symbiotic process in a sense then, because it, it kind of starts with the lyrics, but it also doesn't. And then... Yeah. Yeah. I think that's been, something that's been interesting for me, I think about largely working alone is... Um, I don't have to explain any of it to anyone else, so it can always be symbiotic. And I think that's what I really enjoy. It's why I started this, the Radical Face project in the first place. Um, it's become my most popular, but I was very surprised by this at first. Like, because I was in bands that I thought would be a lot easier to listen to, and I thought this music would be too personal and uncomfortable. And Sometimes I think it still is, but that's okay. It, it works well enough. But uh, yeah, that, that symbiotic idea to me is that I can kind of carry the concept or aspects of the words with me until they feel ready to become the focus. And it happens at different stages on different songs, but um, 
I think writing when you have writing music with no lyrics in mind is interesting, but for me, not usually very fruitful for a record. I end up with songs, but they never have any glue between them, and it just feels kind of like a song. Um, it feels like a moment or a whim. And when I have a, an idea for words in my mind while I'm at a piano or, or something, I'm searching for something to go with the words, and it helps guide me. It helps me go like that. I'm looking for a somber kind of feeling, and, and I find some chords, and I go, that goes with those words, and I've paired them now. That's usually how I know I have something to demo and start putting into an album. So, yeah, it's nonlinear for sure. <laughs> I, I guess it rarely is, but I think I think it's it's interesting because you mentioned bands, and I think in a, in a sort of a band situation, that there may be more of that kind of here's the music, now go write lyrics to it kind of thing. So yeah, I think, have you done that as well, like in bands and so on? I have, um, but I I always feel like. I can only speak from personal experience, but the times that the, the music and the lyric writing is very separate, I noticed the times when I was writing words, I was writing more from a persona. It was hard for me to be super direct and personal and honest in that format because it's more at that point about serving what the song is. And so I'm trying to usually find a, like a persona to go with the song. And I'm like, well, this is all very kind of upbeat, and I, I'm already responding to what's there. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, have, I can say I've been the most satisfied when it's the other way around, when there's a concept or a driving force, and it gives me something to, to work towards. And then when I find it, it's really satisfying and very exciting. Um, the other one feels like happenstance, and then I just kind of made something up to go with it. It, it doesn't feel as glued together or as intrinsic. So um, I've done it, but I, yeah, I, I clearly don't do it a lot. And I think it's just because of that satisfaction problem. I never feel that happy with the result. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think, I think one of the things that stand out to me the most about your songs in general is that they do feel glued together a lot. Like you, you I don't know if it's that obvious, but when you when you put put your when you say it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Like you got you get something like a pound of flesh, which is very sort of driving, and I feel like the story in that is very driving as well, and it has this sort of pace. And then there are sort of more reflective songs where the music is also more reflective. Right, and I think there's a. Uh, I don't think there's any right way to do anything. I think to me, there's only two things to ever pay attention to if you're making art and it's if it's effective to you, first and foremost, like, do I feel like this expresses what I'm trying to do? And, uh, and then otherwise it's, um, there's something about to me when all of the elements feel purposeful, like even musically, like it, it can be, why are you adding that sound there? And I'm like, well, oftentimes in the lyrics, there's a clue. I'm talking about this thing. And so I needed a drum or something that resembled to me a high heart rate. Because this is someone about to do something that is a lot of adrenaline. So I want a heartbeat in there somehow. It could be a bass. It could be like something's going to get across this like beating heart feeling. And once I find the object, I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I liked it on this just drum being this really steady, aggressive thing. And it's relentless, like your heart just won't stop. Uh, so to me, when all those elements are infused, it, it then gives you, um, I, I don't know, there's something about it being symbiotic, which is how it helps me feel like it all has meaning and it's finished. Um, and if I feel like I just added things for... Um, just problem solving like you know when you work on a song and sometimes there's there's an issue with just the arrangement it's just not very interesting and so you just start adding sounds because you're like you need something <laughs> and then you might find a sound that's kind of cool it works okay 
but I'm never that happy with that song. Like every time I've done that, where I just kind of like, I don't know, I'll try a synthesizer, I guess. Like I, I never feel like I really finished the song. I feel like I just, I made it work well enough and I quit. So I really like it when the, it's a feedback loop, the lyrics, the, the arrangements, the melodies all feel like they're related to each other. Do you, do you write do you write with pen or paper by the way or do you write like how do you, how do you like put lyrics onto something oh yeah i have tons of notebooks yeah I, I have just tons and tons of gibberish notebooks um my favorite thing i found recently is a notebook that has uh papers with a little magnetic strip and you can move them around in the notebook that's been amazing to me because i can like redo song orders and stuff in the book. And like, it's, it's so nice that I can move the pages. Um, but yeah, I'm a pen and paper person. Um, there are times that uh, I'm just somewhere else, you know, I'm not at home or I don't have a notebook and I'll punch something into like my phone. But when I get home, I transfer it. I, I like to have a physical record of things. That's, that's really interesting. I want to touch on another thing that you mentioned, which is sort of like you said you 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 need sort of boundaries in order to start writing lyrics, or you need to you just feel like you need to have a set theme. And obviously, your music is very, or your your whole. I mean, you 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 wrote you wrote three albums about the same concept. Yeah. Does that do you need that kind of conceptual thing in order to to or does it help get give you the inspiration you need? It definitely helps. It's also um, I think f I've always really liked the the concept of a constraint, um, but more because I think the constraint forces creativity for me. Like I, I I do it all the time musically. I'll pick these are my songwriting tools. And um, that I can't use others. Like that was when I made that record, The Roots. I only had I had four things to write on, and it was a floor tom, a piano, an acoustic guitar, or voices. And I wrote everything with just those four things. Um, if anything was added, it was because the lyrics or some there was some reason it needed a little more. But I tried to really all songwriting was done with those things, and I could do them all in one chair. I could have a guitar a tom and a piano and um but i i really like that sometimes having these limitations that you just choose or the limitations of a theme because it's not uh i find that basically having something to push against is usually where i grow the most it's it doesn't allow me to um really use any kind of cop-outs. Like I can't just change theme because I don't know how to say it. I can't, um, you know, like when I had such a limited instrument palette, I learned a lot more about just writing the song more effectively because I can't put some fireworks in there or just like add a lot of distortion so it sounds loud. I had to like take away those tools from myself so that I had to learn how to write more effectively for my point and so I've always used it, and it also helps me know in the sprite of the key part. It helps me know when I'm finished. If I could go anywhere, it's hard to know I'm done. Whereas if I say I'm trying to get here specifically, once I arrive, I am finished. I've done all the ideas I have for that idea. We're done. <laughs> I can move on to the next idea. So maybe it's just organization in my mind, but it, it definitely helps, and I notice I write a lot more enthusiastically when I know why I'm writing. Mm. It's interesting that you keep coming back to this sort of, uh, it takes a long time to give birth to a song or to finish it. But I'm also looking at your back catalog in my head and there's, there's a lot of music there. So do you just incessantly write? Yes, I write all the time. Uh, so on average, if I've put out a record, I have twice as many songs I've killed. Um, so 
basically for every 10, I probably get rid of 20. And it's, I keep elements of them. Almost every song that I started doing will have an aspect I liked, but it's either redundant to something I've already done better, or uh, there's, there's some reason that I'm going to ax it. But for me, writing in, in music and, and making things is pretty daily. It's not daily successful. A lot of days are not successful, but um, I've learned to stop seeing a successful writing day. It's not that rewarding to me anymore in either direction. It's really that I like the act of doing it. And sometimes I leave the studio with nothing but garbage. It was a terrible, like everything I did just was awful. But I still had fun. A lot of times, like even just setting up mics or trying an idea, I like the act of it a lot. And so I focus more on the act than the result. And mm. it keeps me from getting into really writer's block or slumps. Um, the only times I've ever really had writer's block in my life is because I was really fixated on uh, getting it done under a certain amount of time and then it all went away. And I've noticed if I just write um, and really don't edit while you write, that's been the biggest lesson for me in all of my creative life is that the creative part and the editing part should never be in the same room. So if I'm at an early stage of a song or I'm just first writing lyrics, I don't care what I put down. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's a good change. I don't care if it's a good performance. I just get it out as fast as possible. And usually I'll sleep on it, look at it with fresh eyes, and that's when I edit. That's when I'll go in aggressively and destroy things. Um, but it makes the part of creating it not punitive. I think you really have to like not punish yourself while you're exploring Otherwise, you're going to make yourself afraid to explore. So the exploring part should be totally free and no judgment as much as you can. And then go put on your judgment editing mean hat and then come back in and slice everything up. Like, But as long as they don't stay in the same room together, I find I just can kind of keep going and I make a lot of stuff. Um, and the other rule was like with writing, I don't have a time limit or a time amount. Like I could go have five minutes and know that it's a, a wasted day. I have no brain mm. and that's fine, but I did five minutes. I just need to go in there and try. And if it's a good day and I'm in there for 10 hours, great, but it doesn't five minutes or 10 hours, either way I try. So yeah, I end up with a lot of songs this way. And what was the writing process for, uh, family tree specifically did you have a lot of that concept sort of up front even before you know album one or okay so that one that was the the probably uh that was the one that most got away from me and so the kind of arc of it was that i made ghost and when i put it out no one liked it it, it, it was a very non-receptive launch and at the other time, Electric President was doing well. So I was like, well, well, okay, I'll just focus on the other band and I'll just do this for me, much more so. Um, and so I was writing the next concept for the record and it was very heavily inspired by just books I had been reading, um, like John Steinbeck and uh, 100 Years of Solitude by Marquez and like I was reading To Kill a Mockingbird. I was reading a lot of these family sagas and I come from a huge, very dysfunctional family. And so uh, it ended up being an interesting topic that I was like, I think I want to do a series of really short albums, but that each one covers a generation. And that exploded into like so many songs. Um, <laughs> And the writing period for that was two years. Uh, so I started it in 2007 and was writing for it all the way to 2009, but recording no actual songs, just demos and words and um, pretty much just a long period of pushing the ideas out while I was more officially working with Electric President. And, and then in 2010, I was already recording the album and that's uh, when Welcome Home ended up on a Nikon commercial. 
in Europe. And out of the blue, everyone was like, what is this record? And I was like, the one from three years ago that no one liked. <laughs> and now everyone's like, you need to go tour. And I was like, what? Like, it was all like completely out of the blue to me. Like the band that no one likes is now the one they like. And I have no idea how to play this live. I made it by myself. Um, and like some of the songs have a hundred tracks on them because I layered so much. I don't know how I'm going to play this. <laughs> and, uh, but luckily uh, I was already recording this next record. So it kind of timed up and I could start touring for the roots and, and it ended up working out, but it was all pretty like, none of this makes any sense to me. I have no idea why anything works. Um, I just make things. <laughs> it goes where it goes. But, uh, but yeah, all, all of the initial ideas were in that period between 2007 and 2009. Um, each record had maybe two songs that would happen over the course of making the record that ended up on the album that were newer. Mm -hmm. But the initial framework for the idea was written in that two-year period. Um, and then it took eight years to finish. Like six more years of recording. <laughs> Um, and rewriting lyrics, like, or did you did you did you revisit them? Or did yeah, you... no, they mostly all got rewritten. It's a, I would say, from those initial pages to final result, I would say the lyrics that made it through the whole journey. There was like probably only one or two songs on each record that stayed pretty true to the original. Uh, the actual original writing, the concept stayed the same, but I found a very different way to tell it. Um, it. Like sometimes it was even just move the point of view. Like when I got to the record, I was like, oh, I'm going to tell it from the point of view of this person in the story, not that person. So I rewrote it. It was like emotionally, it'd be more interesting from their angle. And uh, so it allowed me to be much more free with like I knew I wanted a different arrangement and I was like, it should be from her, not him. Like it allowed me a lot of flexibility. That's that sounds like a pretty extensive rewrite as well. Changing the perspective completely to the other person. Oh, it was. Yeah. Sometimes it was, uh, the only thing that carried over was that core event. And, uh, that's, that's kind of something I really love about working with themes over specific words is that, mm. um, it still allows the studio to feel creative. And I still have flexibility with how I approach the words and the music and how they'll combine. So that way I don't feel too hemmed in. And so I, I think I intentionally leave that looseness mm -hmm. so that when I get to really making the final version, I, I, I can make a lot of decisions in that moment, as opposed to having to completely agree with myself from six years ago, you know, I, that's an unlikely event. Do you, um, can we maybe delve into one of the songs from that album? I think the mute is one of those songs that seem to really resonate with people. Do you remember writing that and sort of, well, you obviously you've written it probably many times over. That's actually one that I did not rewrite. That's one oh, really? that stayed the same from the beginning. Um, and I think that I think it stayed the same because of the inspiration of the subject. So uh, I'm from a very large family. I'm one of 10 children. And then I have a lot of nieces and nephews. And one of my nephews is autistic and nonverbal. And so the idea for the song it was when I was kind of developing the, the, the whole concept is just, you know, there's a total active life of a person that doesn't speak and you just don't know it. You will never know it. And it was really just a, a kind of a muse. It was, it was a thing of what, what goes on in your head. You're clearly observant and intelligent. You just don't talk. And so that was one that, I think because the the subject was more something just very in front of me in my own life, it was something that I wrote and the, the kind of story all came pretty quick. And I wrote the basic idea of the chords and 
uh, when I went to record it, it didn't change a ton. You know, I added a bit more to the arrangement, but that's about it. It was a, that was one of the fast ones on that record. Like, I think I made it in two days and was, and never went back. It was very uh, easy comparatively. So. What was a hard one? Uh, the song on that record, that would be the Crooked Kind. I recorded that nine times over from start to finish to find it. And like, I would get to the end and go, no, and delete it. And it was, uh, that was probably the most I've ever re-recorded a song completely in my life. Um, and every iteration, like some of them were wildly different. I just couldn't find the mood. I would get to where it, it always felt off and I didn't know why. And uh, the only reason it ended up working, I think was uh, the last time I did it, I just didn't start with guitar. I was like, don't use the guitar to begin, start with something else. So I started with drums. Like I'm gonna start with percussion and then see where I go from there. And that's how I finally got a version that worked. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I remember being really frustrated with that song because I knew there was a song I just couldn't figure it out. It turned out fantastic though, so probably worth the nine retries of it. <laughs> I in the end I was actually really happy with it, but yeah, it was it was so. It was, that was one where I could not figure out how to glue the like. I was like, it needs to feel mysterious and spooky in the beginning, and then uh, like the acceptance and joy of acceptance at the end, and I can't get it to transition. It just always sounded wrong. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you know, some songs are just frustrating. Yeah, it's a hard thing, I guess. Like being like with with that limitation, obviously it funnels a lot of creativity but on the, at the same time it also sort of yeah you need to get to point eight from point a to point b and then you need to find your way through that somehow <laughs> yeah well that's that's the thing is uh no matter what te technique i've ever chosen to use as like a method um all of them bite you i have never found one that was like smooth sailing it's smooth sailing at times um but I think that's where if you just find a process that you love, the problems, you'll deal with them. I, I almost think of it like a, just like any relationship. If there's someone in your life, like you're like, yeah, he's a pain in the ass, but I love him. So I put up with it. It's kind of like that. <laughs> you're just trying to find uh, something that you sync with enough that the problems are worth it. Mm. Um, so yeah, I pay for it sometimes, but I still prefer it. I want to touch on some of the themes that you, you sort of bring up more than others, I guess, in songs. Uh, there, there's definitely some things that come back a lot in terms of imagery and yeah, in terms of general topics. I mean, one of the ones that show up a lot is ghosts. I think through, obviously, uh, the album Ghost, but also yeah. aside from that, it comes up a lot. What, what, what did they signify to you? So... Ghosts for me um, are not a uh, metaphysical entity. I don't, I'm not using them in the term in the way that I think most people would. For me, it came up is the idea of essentially memories. And I've always, I don't know how I got stuck on it, but at some point I liked the idea that as humans, we all haunt each other. That we have impact on each other's lives and even if the person dies or you just don't see them anymore they still show up and uh and i don't say haunted as a negative thing i just mean that they're with you and they can still affect you mm -hmm. and i always liked the idea of we are haunting every building we live in that was the initial idea for ghosts is anywhere you live you're going to become part of it you go into the walls you you know, something you forgot behind when you moved could show up for the next person. Uh, it's like there's always traces of you being left around. Mm. But also through memory, we do it all the time. And 
So for me, oftentimes, ghost really just means the past that's not totally going away. Mm -hmm. You're not forgetting it. And you're carrying it with you for some reason. Yeah, because I, I, that I mean, something like wrapped in piano strings, for example, it, there, there's, uh, it. I mean, you're better to speak on this than me, but it it, it feels like there's this, sort of this presence of some something watching over you, or sort of being there still, or you finding comfort in something that's sort of gone. Uh, yeah. I mean, that song is from the point of view of the memory. So it's the, that one's the, the, it's kind of a story of a guy who, it's like, if you're, it's inside this house, and then you have this guy who, he kills himself, a sort of in a, almost a fit, it was almost something that was done irrationally, yeah. and went too far. Uh, but then, so the, the story is he's basically kind of cursed to watch uh, the the woman he was married to in the house forget him. So he's got to sit there and watch as she remarries and moves on, and like he just becomes distant. And so it's a it was like this thing of like the a high cost of a rash decision. And but that was one that I wanted to write it from the point of view of the ghost, not the the person being haunted. And this one, he's not trying to make it worse. Like, he already screwed up. So he's just like, I'm just trying to help as best I can. But I can't reach very much. Mm. So. Where does the title come from? Wrapped in Piano Strings? It's a... Uh, I don't... This is the, the sad part. Is I don't remember who wrote it. But it was from a poem. And I remember reading a poem uh, where it was saying... It was like as though the the piano wire enveloped them it was like almost describing it like a the obsession of a musician and it becomes like a cocoon mm -hmm. of like the instrument is trapping you or something and so i just like this idea of that like your own obsession or your own decisions can become everything like you make too big of a one and now it's just consumed you that's the thing that you can't break out of. And so somehow the imagery just stuck of a person like wrapped in wire. And, uh, you know, and this one, it's also the anchor, like something slowly sinking. Um, but a lot of stuff I did on that record, I was intentionally, I like the idea of removing key components of every song that would make it totally explained. Mm. And uh, just taking out two or three things of every track that would make it make total sense so that you had to interpret aspects of it. Um, but I also watch a lot of David Lynch and really like things that are <laughs> unfinished or unexplained in that way. So, yeah. Do you get a lot of weird interpretations thrown at you from people based on that? Like, do, do people take other meanings from your songs that maybe you intended originally? Yeah, um, but I actually really like that. It's one of those things where it's never bothered me. I really think um, one of the cool things about art is that it can be interpreted. And even I kind of have a philosophy of lyric writing is that you can be as personal as you want, but if you would like someone to relate to it, remove your details. So um for me, details being like proper nouns, like just don't use specific names or specific places and reduce it back enough and you're just getting into human experience. Mm -hmm. Everyone goes through rejection or fear or any kind of emotion you would try to get across. And the you can then build abstract details on top of that. You can play with language in a lot of ways, but when it's hyper-specific to you, um, I think that can be cathartic in the moment, but it's just hard to relate to. Like I've heard songs before that I can tell it's like, it's almost like the, the artist is keeping me out. It's very just about them. And I kind of like, I don't know, going back as deep as you can get to it and then relating it. And then people can interpret that however they want. Um, I think a lot of times if there's a core, uh, you know, like to use that song, I could reduce wrapped in piano strings to I made a mistake but I still love you and I think a lot of people have 
felt that. Like, I screwed this up, and I'm always going to care about you, and I know it'll never work. And, like, that was the idea of the emotion. Like, I was like, there are times of even, like, you know, there there's a, like, in that song, some of the arrangements slightly ecstatic because it's still, like, I have strong feelings about this, even though I can never fix it. Um, so I think people can relate to that, that core idea, even though I'm getting into abstractions, like being wrapped in strings and thrown in the ocean and stuff, like, uh, that, that core thing that drives it, I think is relatable to most people who have lived a certain amount of time, lived long enough to fuck up and really wish you could undo it. Anyone who's ever had that. <laughs> I guess the same goes for... The whole family tree series as well it's a very specific story but everything works all songs kind of speak to an emotion beyond sort of what the story is yeah or what the characters it, are living through exactly and I, I i i always hope i always hope it can translate um but it's also i have found it's a way sometimes it's the writer to be more honest i i adore hiding in fiction you can write about really, really personal things and you're not specifically writing about that event. You're writing about the emotional content of the event. But there are times I don't want to write about necessarily the thing that happened to me, but I love that I could get all of it off my chest through a character and the, the, the core of it is the same. But uh, I even have oftentimes I've realized for myself, having done it both ways now, I have more empathy for oftentimes the character I invent that I do for myself. For myself, I can be like, get over it, you're fine. And like for the character, I'm like, oh, that's awful. It could be the exact same event. <laughs> so I find sometimes I'm actually more emotional when it's not about me, but it's something I've experienced and I have empathy for. Hmm. So uh, I really like that thing. I've always liked this idea that you, you, you know, we're human beings and we've been telling the same stories from the beginning. That's why you can read like Cervantes or something and be like, this is still here. Like we're still battling these same things. That happens to be, you know, 500 AD or whatever, but um, still the same things. We're, you know, people are people through all time. So that tells me there's a lot of just core human things that we can always discuss and just explore through different modern context. Hmm. Yeah, and then you have written some very, very uh, on the other. I feel like the the therapy EP is very much you writing about me. I I don't want to say yourself because I don't want to put your words into your mouth, but it's it seems a little bit less metaphorical. That one is the most direct I've ever been, um, and it was because really what happened was I had a desire to create but my life had basically fallen apart. And so all of my energy was, it was like I moved across the country, I was going to therapy a lot. And it was the only thing, um, it, was, it was fascinating, like just to learn how the, the mind works and you know quirks or things I get hung on and how, again, they're entirely textbook. Like I found a lot of, delight in realizing that this thing that I think is this very personal failing or horror or something and they're like oh no it's statistically just this and like it's very well documented and studied and I was like oh cool and that lack of uniqueness was to me actually wonderful that even in your pain you actually just share this with humans this is just being a person in all yeah. these regards but it was so consuming the process of it that I couldn't I had nothing to talk about so I had a desire to create but the only thing I'm doing is like I'm going to therapy all the time <laughs> and so I started writing about it I started writing about like what I'm learning and uh you know writing things that were even just like what would have what would I have told myself at 14 when everything was really just felt overwhelming and insanely hard what would i as an adult say to that person you know it's like i started writing from like weird thought experiments like this and so yeah it's most it's very personal 
um, uncomfortably so. I, I, it's not something I would want to do all the time, for sure. It was it was a neat experiment, but when I got to the end of it, I was like, no thanks, I, I don't want to do more of this. Until I started doing this Hidden Hollow thing, and I was like, well, I don't know what to write about. I'm already writing this giant record, so I guess I'll write about whatever's going on right now today. Um, so I started doing it again, uh, for better or for worse. Yeah. And actually that, because there's a song on that called Missing Roads, mm -hmm. the opening track on uh, the, well, the opening track on what's now on Spotify as, as the Hidden Hollow stuff. Oh, right. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that touches on another topic that you do a lot, which is sort of roads and walking and, you know, this kind of clarity that comes from being alone in nature kind of thing. Do, do you hike a lot? So I write a lot uh, outdoors, so I'm, it seeps in all of the time. Um, yes, I love being just in the woods, like it's a, or just sitting in a nice park. Like that's, mm. if you give me a day off, I'm probably just going to want to go sit outside somewhere <laughs> if the weather permits. Um, and so, yeah, these are constant themes but it's also just this, uh, to me, this idea of like the, the walking path, it's, it's kind of, you know, this is a, it's a very old metaphor you get into, you know, that song was rereading Robert Frost of The Road Not Taken, and you know, like just, um, just getting into the, like we're traveling whether we like it or not, you can't stay constant. And so to me, the, the road is always choices and I got to pick something. Um, even indecision is a, is a road. Like you're going whether you like it or not. And, uh, you know, and so it's, it's for me, it's kind of a constant thing of where am I at and where am I headed? And at the same time, you're supposed to be present and it's very hard to juggle all this. And so, yeah, it's a, that's a recurring theme for me but it's often because I don't quite know what I'm doing. Um, even as long as I've been doing music, it still doesn't really make sense to me. I have no idea why anything works. If someone asked me why I was that successful, I'm like, I honestly don't know. I have no real idea, you know? I've had a song do incredibly well, which is very strange to me. I'm like, why? I don't know what I did. Like, I, I, it's, it's still very odd. Like, why did that work? Um, and yeah, so that, that concept of the road is something I think about all the time. Like, I can tell, like, you know, you stop for the night. You have times where you slow down and you're going to sleep for a while, but you inevitably move again. And uh, it's, it's something I think about in my daily life uh, often. So ends up lyrically all the time. Let's delve into that that one song that uh, that has become quite successful. Then, uh, welcome yeah. home. Do Do you remember? Like, obviously, there, you weren't planning on writing a hit there. Do you remember writing it? Uh, somewhat, but not. It's it's not a. It's not relative to how it appears and how well it's done. There wasn't like a particular moment that I would say was noteworthy in making it. Mm -hmm. Like that's always been the odd part to me is something that I sometimes think that I do quickly do really well. And sometimes things I labor over don't or vice versa. I found no rhyme or reason. So as far as that one and like any memories of it, no. It was, it was just part of a record I was making. It wasn't the first thing I recorded. It wasn't the last. It was somewhere in the middle. Um, and uh, I mean, a lot of times, usually the way it's made is it had much more to do with necessity. Like, uh, so I have a philosophy with recording and um, you're never going to have the right time and you're never going to have the right setup. 
like a lot of people get fixated on getting their environment perfect, thinking that'll make the difference. And I've never found that to be true. Um, so anytime I'm making a song, like say with that one, someone I once asked me, why I like the like footsteps and the clapping? And I was like, I just didn't have a drum set. I was, that's just what I had. I had a, a board on the ground because I just needed to make some sort of sound. And that's what sounded okay. And I was like, well, I need something to lift in the chorus. So I just did a lot of hand claps. It's just what I had. I didn't have a lot of stuff with me. I had a piano, a guitar. and um, Where I was at the time, I couldn't play very loud or people would call the police on me. So um, yeah, I was just using what I had. I knew the big thing was that, I, that there's a, it's a bittersweet song. It's a, it's, it's catharsis is a big part of it, but it's a catharsis that doesn't last. So I needed these outpourings of emotion. And my idea was, I just love the sound of choruses, choral music. So I just like, I'll just record this like 40 times. I just kept doing it over and over and over. And because it's supposed to be like this outpouring. And uh, I think that moment just worked for people. Like there's something about that that connects. The fact that the most notable part is non-lyric, it's just kind of almost yelling, just getting it off your chest. Um, but as far as like any like anecdotes about the recording process or like it being a moment, no, that's always what's so funny to me. I was like, I don't know, it just, it's not like I put it out even and people particularly liked it. I just put out the record and uh, it didn't do well and we moved on. <laughs> it was not like a, there, was, there was no moment until the, the Nikon spot that like highlighted it. One guy at Nikon really liked it. Yeah, he, <laughs> and it was really funny because I know in Europe it got played a lot, but it wasn't licensed in America. So I never had to hear it, which was great. Um, Cause that's really uncomfortable hearing your own music and spaces away from you outside your studio. Uh, it's awful. But yeah, from what I gather, it played on TV all the time. Um, which yeah, I is... remember, I, I'm Swedish. I remember having that on TV a lot. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Um, and then when I when I rediscovered you later in life, around I guess the roots, I was like, oh, it's that song. Right. I can place it. <laughs> yeah. But I uh, know it's 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 never been um, to me effort and reward are completely unrelated. Um, mm -hmm. It's never been any rhyme or reason, and I. I so for me, that kind of puts it back to this idea of you don't know how any of this will work. I think the trick is just to have really high standards for yourself and do everything you can to achieve them. And if you can feel, if you can feel the emotion that you're hoping someone else can feel, someone will get it. Um, but it can't be the satisfaction of merely creating something. I think whenever we first create something, we're just happy that something in our heads exists externally. Mm. And, you know, because I can say, like, the moments of creation always feel great. And half the time when I go back with objective ears, they're not. But it was fun to do, you know. So I, I always go, that's fine. Just doing it is fun and worthwhile in itself. But if I can't hear it or feel it when it comes back out of a speaker and I'm no longer performing it or doing it, it's not there. It, it was only in that moment. But uh, yeah, so I have no idea. I really can't tell you. I don't know why the person in Nikon heard this song. I don't know. It is just a random email. And I figured it would just be something that got aired a couple times and that was it. And it just turned into this thing that just keeps going and has like pretty much paid for me to make whatever weird record I want to make. And I don't have to worry too much if it does anything, because that song just doesn't go away. So um, I'm very grateful. It's not one that uh, I've had people in the past almost be like, does it feel weird to just have one song do so well? And almost like I should be upset that there's not more doing that. And I'm surprised I won. I was just like, what? I still like, I never thought that what I was doing was that relatable. So 
one is still weird to me, and I'll take it. Like that's it pays for me to be an artist. I'm not going to complain. Do you still connect with it as a song, as a lyric? I do. Um, it's a. I do because thematically it keeps happening. Um, it's something that, like the the core idea of the song is when you leave the place you're from or anywhere that you've lived a long time and become kind of part of the fabric of it, when you move on um, and return, even if it was just for a year or two, but you come back, there's, it's a, for me, always been such a mixed set of feelings. On one hand, it's nice to see such familiar things. Uh, there's a, a relief in it because it, it's just so known to you. But then on the other hand, it moved on without you. You were no longer part of that fabric. That fabric filled the gap. And you can't ever totally go back to where it was. You might find a different place in the fabric, but it always feels different. That that ship sailed. And it's kind of the cost of leaving a place, I think, of even if you return, you don't return the same way. And so uh, the to me, that was like the, the emotion of it. I was like, it has to be bittersweet. It has to be joyous, but also I don't belong here anymore. Not totally. And I also don't know where I belong. So mm -hmm. it's, it, this is, it's like, it's almost like a, you know, the, the, the port in a storm kind of thing. I'm very happy to have the shelter, but I know I need to go again. So it's a, uh, to be able to connect to that. Yeah. I still move around. I still don't quite know where I'm going to live. I still, I know, you know, as the vaccines happen and pandemics ease up, like we're going to move again and, because uh, I'm still not sure where that is. Like, I find things, but I've never quite been somewhere and said, this is home. Mm -hmm. uh, so, as such, yeah, the topic, the topic still applies. I'm still looking. Um, so, it doesn't feel weird to sing it. Um, but it is, it is interesting to have uh, maybe just this part of, like, I thought I would have moved on from that by now. <laughs> You know, like 15 years later and I'm like, yeah, I still don't know the answer to this one. <laughs> uh, maybe I never will. Well, the nice thing about it is you, you have to play it and it's probably better if you, if you still feel a part of it. Yeah, it, I, I have thought more than once I'm glad that it ended up being something that is still relatable to me. Um, mm -hmm. I would play it anyway because I really believe that shows are, are a service. They're for the audience. Um, I mean, yes, you get paid for it. Um, not that I make money on tour. I usually don't. But it's still, uh, to me, a show is someone who has enjoyed what you do. And that's why I've always liked audience to pick playlists. Like, basically, what do you want me to play? I'm not going to. This isn't for me. You bought the ticket. What would you like me to play? That's how I perceive it. Um, and I know I'll play that song forever anytime I play a show. But I also just lucked out on that one, too, in that it's an easy song to make communal and to share just because it needs lots of voices. And I always like it when that's such a fun thing to have everyone do it once. It feels really good. So the fact that it can be a shared song and it's the song that i will play forever i was like i lucked out there too because it could be some like personally painful moment that i wrote a song about that they're like hey play that forever i'd be like oh that's terrible <laughs> like <laughs> it could be a. it's like what was a fire and rain the uh, james taylor about his friend's suicide yeah. that could be your biggest song you're constantly yeah. talking about your dead friend. I was like, yeah, it could be a lot worse. You know? Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, no complaints. Um, 
what are the ships that are launching from your chest in that song? So the way that that song is broken up is you have the, the first half. I read a lot about insomnia um, just because I have always had sleep. I have sleep trouble, always have. So that is a, I write a lot because I can't sleep. So I read a lot about not sleeping. <laughs> Um, so the first half is that it's like the worst feeling to me is like the 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 sun coming up and I'm still not tired is like that's such a frustrating feeling. Um, but you know, and then you but you're you're back somewhere at least like you can say like you know this stuff is still with me, but I've I'm somewhere familiar. And then we get to the second half, which is. I think a lot of times when we're bumbling through life and trying to figure out what we're doing and making our way, it's a lot of mistakes. And it's a lot of, uh, you just kind of collect all these scars, like things you're like, why did I do that? I wish I had never said that. Why did I go to this thing? Like it, it can be a lot of those feelings. And so again, you go somewhere familiar and you feel like you can just let it all go. So to me, it was just sort of the imagery of just like the, all the missteps and stuff for a little bit, I could just let them out and you don't need to name them. It doesn't need to even be particular. So that was where like, it was between like the, you know, peeling scars off, like just get all of this out of me for a minute because I'm in a safe place and I can do that. Mm. But then again, it's like after each one it like goes into like uncertainty again and so uh that song is a lot about like the you know just kind of having a moment that that joy of being somewhere familiar and uh but you just know it's not gonna last like I, i'm gonna go back out like i don't really belong here anymore so yeah long form way of saying regrets <laughs> <laughs> Every song can be boiled down as soon as you take away the metaphors. To, like you said earlier, it's just like you can boil it down to a word or like a sentence. But it's I think I think that I think what you said earlier, which is really true, is that you know the more I was going to say generic. I'm not that it's clearly not the word I'm looking for here. The more you make a song, sort of universal even if it's about a very specific thing the the, the more accessible it becomes yeah because i think it, it gives it gives someone room to bring their experiences to it and to me there is art that you witness and then there is art that you um kind of envelop yourself in you can see yourself within and i like both for different reasons but um it's so like I've been in and like even with music I've been in bands that are very about performing right so you, you're going to show up and kind of give off a, a sort of a character or a persona or um, it's like something that people witness and then like say like with whatever I'm touring with Radical Face my goal is I hope it feels like a living room at the end I don't want it to feel like a stage I want it to feel shared because pretty much I'm always focusing with that project on nostalgia and things that shape us, like where we come from and what it is to be alive, just a person. And those are the core concepts in all of the records. I just choose different venues. You know, the new one is I'm using the angle of the fairy tale because I've been reading about the psychology of fairy tales. But like, it's still... Um, just writing about human experience, about what it is to be alive. It's joy, pain, it's all those things. And so I just like the idea of someone being able to bring their experiences to it. You can have your own version of these things, your own joys, your own missteps. I don't need to clarify mine. Um, think about yours if you want to. I, I, to be fair, a lot of people don't. Like that's where some of this music it either really resonates with people. Uh, I think things that come from more somber or intense places, people either really resonate or they're like, I don't want to feel this way. Like I have no interest in this. 
-hmm. It's uh, pretty dividing. But uh, yeah, I like the idea of that space of you should think about yours, not mine. I'm not trying to tell you my life story. Um, which is I, that, I mean, the last kind of big topic I wanted to touch on, you touch, ah, I'm going to redo that question. That was not good at all. Uh, <laughs> the, the last kind of big topic I wanted to touch, I don't even know how to say that. I lost my English. Touch on with you. There you go. The last, the last big topic I wanted to touch on with you that comes back a lot, obviously, is, is family and sort of how family, I guess, shapes you as a person. Is that fair to say? There's a lot of yeah, family. There is. Um, I, I think family or lack thereof is a huge influence on anyone. And it's just as a species where we're social monkeys, you know, like there's, a, there's an element of that, no matter what, even the absence of it, is a huge thing that shapes you. And so uh, to me, the concept of family, it's something that people talk about oftentimes only with this idea of, I would say warmth. Like it's a word that we usually associate as being purely a positive. And I actually think of family as just intense. It's intensely whatever it is. It can be intensely negative. It can be intensely terrifying. It can be intensely joyous. It can be intensely comforting. Um, but I've noticed there's not a lot of, in my experience, middle ground. And it shapes you in one way or the other. Um, it can hold you back. It can boost you up, but usually intensely so. Mm -hmm. Families are usually either very accepting or very critical. It's, it's a place for intense feelings. And... Uh, it's also just the only people who probably witness us develop so closely. The rest of the world, we, you know, we edit ourselves. We, we present what we think needs to be seen in each moment. And no one can do that all the time. Family sees you at your worst, when you fall apart the most, when you are the least yourself, or it's the thing you hide yourself from the most that they can never see the real me because they won't accept it it's such an intense place and so to me it's just sort of the the pressure that forms the volcanoes like it's gonna come out and so as a a formative thing for me it's it's coming from a really big but also very dysfunctional family it's yeah it's such it's such a place of intense feelings and uh one that I can never really settle. I've noticed it doesn't matter how much I turn it over in my head or try to like give it clear boxes or something. It is just, it's, it's such a through line, even its absence at times. Um, you know, cause I'm, I'm a person, I got kicked out. I came out to my parents when I was like 14 and I got kicked out of the house and I've, I've had long periods of being ostracized. And even that is hugely formative. The, the absence of the family is a giant shaping thing. And so, yeah, anytime I notice I start writing about it, it's one that's, uh, it's almost an easy topic to mine emotionally because it's inherently emotional. Um, even the people I've met that have no real feeling towards their families, they have a lot of feeling about their absence of feelings. <laughs> like it's like a... It's, it's almost like their lack of intensity, they feel very intense about. Like, it's, it's, it's like there's no escaping it. And so, uh, and then also it's just universal. Like, it, it's one that everyone has to figure out for themselves. Um, and all of them are different, but not that different. That's the part I've been learning as I get older. It's, a, it's the same story written a million times. But... Yeah, comes up for me a lot. I think it's it's uh, it was a really big. I think music was my therapist before I got a therapist. Uh, it was my my way of working out a lot of things I couldn't understand, uh, but I could at least do something with the emotion, even though I couldn't understand it. Um, 
now I'm writing a little differently. I think I have some other venues for that topic. <laughs> Did you, did you get a different perspective on your lyrics from doing therapy? Yes, uh, there's actually, it's a little startling how much I, uh, was often saying the same things and I didn't realize how much I was repeating myself. Um, and it was just because I was lyrically trying to sort something that isn't settling. And so I would like constantly return to it at different angles. And each angle felt like I was talking about something new, but the core was not. And so, yeah, it's interesting to observe yourself, even going back to the beginning and realizing that like, you know, this thing where I'm writing about distrust or something, I'm like, it's actually the same emotional topic. I just put it into a different box. I dress it up differently, but it's the same thing. But yeah, it's been interesting to look back and realize how much I was trying to, uh, honestly, I think sometimes just find use for it. Like, what is, what is the point of like, you know, sort of human emotional pain? Why do we have this? And uh, I liked that it could be a connecting feature it's a way that when you can talk to someone who's been through a similar thing you, for a moment, you really connect and you feel seen. Um, and then I later found out that's a, a big truth. People really bond through hardship mm -hmm. and they bond in a way that often is more resonant than happiness. So it's something that creates and holds social groups. You're always going to remember the person that you could be vulnerable with more than the person that you could go have a beer with. They just resonate longer. So it's kind of what holds us. And so there is a, a point, there is a purpose, but I think I was searching for that purpose through lyrics or through art or like, how do you connect with people through this? And uh, yeah, I realized in hindsight, I was doing that a lot. Now I do it with some awareness, but it's no, it's, it's the only difference really is the awareness. It's still there. Yeah, it's, it's good because I feel it's maybe a lot of the yeah. Well, we've already touched on this. Uh, a lot of sort of the family tree stuff and so on. The metaphor, like the characters, must have a little bit of you or someone close to you a lot of the time as well. And it, these sort yeah. of. Um... It's a lot of half truths. So there's a lot of things in there that there's a, a kernel of absolute truth, and then there's it's. It's all dolled up in fiction, but the, no, I, I was saying a lot of very true things over the course of those records. It was, uh, it was a really interesting thing. Like probably the biggest revelation was my boyfriend realizing, uh, in hindsight, cause he's toured with me forever and all this stuff. And then he, he over time because he just knows more he was like i had no idea how much this was true and i was like it was just hiding in plain sight it was a way i could talk about it because mm -hmm. i couldn't talk about it not to the people they couldn't hear it so i invented someone who could hear it and um i didn't think i was doing this at the time this is the hindsight you know i, I get what i was yeah. doing now but yeah it's a uh, I don't know. I think it's kind of a useful tool, but also art is always narcissistic. Like we're always in some ways writing about ourselves. Um, it's kind of a, I don't think anyone would be an artist if they didn't feel like I have something specific to say. Um, the funny part is you get to the end and you realize you didn't. Um, it's just being a person. <laughs> it's not that different. It's just, you, you have a different angle on it. And that's the value. I think the beauty of art it, to me is it's, it's, all these beings trying to observe what it is to exist and all they can show you is how they see it. Mm -hmm. And the fun of it is the tourism. I can see someone else be like, well, this is how I see that thing. And I'm like, Oh, that's so different. What did I would do it this way. And that's where it's infinite. You can always have another perspective because they are singular, but the content, the core idea, no, there's no original ideas, just how you talk about them. Mm -hmm. 
to finish this up, what is what's your favorite thing you've written? Do you have something you go back to that you're like, oh, that was good? And I have different categories of this. I have things that I'm proud of, and those are not always the same as feeling accomplished. Like, so there, there's, because there's different things to be satisfied, right? Sometimes you write things and you feel clever. And other times you write something and you feel honest. And other times you write something and you feel, um, uh, like sometimes even just efficient, you feel like you really got that in a few words and that's really satisfying, like just sort of the act of writing and that's an accomplishment. So I can say the, the things that stand out, there have been songs that I'm really happy with that I, I felt like I did the topic justice. Those are probably the ones that like resonate with me the most over time. Um, my own cleverness becomes boring. Like that's not a, it's not something that will hold. And you know that's usually, I think, masking some insecurity. Like the way of being like I can write and I am good at this. <laughs> and like that always fades. But I have songs like uh, I was very happy with the song, even though I will never play it again. Uh, there's a song Night Close that I didn't put on a record because I didn't want to play it again. Um, but that was just, it was a really hard song to write and I didn't know how to say it for, I'd say years. I tried to write it, I'd say for about six years and then I finally did. And then I will never play it again. It was a big accomplishment, but it was intensely uncomfortable. So I think like I have a pride in the song because it was so uncomfortable, but I still felt I needed to do it. Like it wasn't going away. I tried to ignore it and it wouldn't stop. So it's a personal achievement, but in a way that like, I wouldn't say like, oh, those are the best lyrics I've ever written. They were the hardest, some of the hardest ones I've written. So, uh, but then other times I think like, I don't know, there, there are times song wise that I feel like I just, I feel like I just got something uh, that just had no fat on it. I think like uh, uh, the other times that I feel good about something is like, it feels like no wasted words. There's no, there's zero filler in this song for what I was trying to say. Um, because sometimes just by the nature of music, you're like, well, I still have three more sentences. I've kind of said it. I got to fill it out though. <laughs> and like, so that it's not as satisfying. Um, but I would say, so yeah, ones that that stick otherwise are usually that. It's usually that I feel like I just said only what I needed to say. Um, and then probably one other I can be specific about that was an odd one was uh, it was when I was writing the song Glory on Ghost. I wanted to write a song where no major event is described. It's only the aftermath of major events that is described, and can that still be cohesive? If you have no real content, mm. only the emotional response to content, and uh, that it still got across, that felt like an accomplishment to me. That, like, I never even said what the subject was. <laughs> I <laughs> implied it through, like, marching yeah. and whistling or something, but I never said it. Um, so I, that, that was, things like that can feel like, I feel clever when I do that. <laughs> it also comes back to what you said earlier, which is like reducing and taking away three key components to make it do something different and not be so on the nose. Yeah, that was definitely a big part of making that record was like, don't, don't say it, take out a key point. Um, but that was the one where I took out the most, I was like, mm -hmm. there's, lyrically like i never say who the other person is i never say how this connected to that and i was like but it still worked and i, I felt glad that i was like oh that is possible you can have it this loose and still function and uh, yeah at the time i think i was still just 
That's something I'm noticing as I get older. I have less interest in cleverness. Um, that was a lot more fun in the beginning. Now I'm very interested in the directness. How direct can I be without anything obfuscating it? That's become more fascinating mm -hmm. um, than being clever. Turns a phrase. Mm. Clever turns a phrase. Yeah, it doesn't need to be quotable. I just I, I like that I can say it in a way that feels completely true. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ben. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. No problem. Thanks for letting me ramble. I, <laughs> Hopefully, it, it made enough sense. <laughs> incredibly insightful rambling. So. Thank okay. You so much for that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> and and this is cool. I'm glad to hear someone talking about lyrics. No one does. So. Thank you so uh, much. Good luck. When's the, when's, the, when's the new album coming out? Uh, we're figuring that out. I'm still um, doing too many revisions, um, as I do. But we're going to kind of figure it out, and I'm trying to figure out how to space out the material because it's so much. Mm. Um, you know, because when I say 30 songs, the, a lot of them are like six and seven minute songs, too. It's like, it's, it's it went insane. It's too enormous. So I'm trying to be like, what is a reasonable amount to take in at a time? I also love uh, serialized things, like serialized books and stuff. I think are really cool. So I wanted to do it in a like chapter kind of setting. So it'll be six chapters that come out. Um, Exciting. Yeah, I'm really happy with it. It's it's my favorite thing I've made in a very long time. And it's it's back to the the metaphors in the fairy tales as well. Yeah, I've been really into the the psychology of the fairy tale, and it's mm -hmm. a it's a way to prepare uh, children, so that they can absorb overwhelming information without rejecting it. Mm -hmm. So you can teach them about danger through curiosity, because if you just come in and say there are people in the world who will murder you, that's no good. But if you can say there's a wolf, and if you're not prepared, the wolf could eat you, they could absorb that. It's the same idea. So I decided to write one for adults. So it's about existential problems and death and all kinds of things, but it's in uh, a reduced and simple language with symbols. So sounds like a very good it sounds like a very good fodder for me reaching out to you again at some point in the future. Go yeah, if you, wanna, this, if, you want, <laughs> if you want to see how I dissect a fairy tale concept, uh, it's been really, really interesting and fun. And uh, I'm, I'm illustrating the whole thing. It's, a, it's an enormous amount of work, but I'm really having a blast. It's, it's been my, the, the pandemic let me really just focus on it. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. Hopefully it doesn't suck. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for having me.